Richard King's, he spent more time reading philosophy than on doing um, artificial intelligence. So I was, as a philosopher, I was very pleased to hear this. My name is Herman Philips, uh, and I'm a professor at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Now, um, Murray also published uh, quite recently a book called Embodiment and the Inner Life, published by OUP in 2010. I don't need to recommend that to you because I think his lecture will be a recommendation, of course, not by him saying all this, but by showing it, and the floor is yours. Well, um, actually, just picking up uh, where, uh, where we just left off, um, I, I've noticed that it's sort of the dumb thing uh, for plenary speakers to uh, show some kind of knowledge and appreciation of, of art. And uh, today happens to be the uh, 150th uh, anniversary of the birth of Gustav Klimt. So I thought I'd, uh, uh, an artist who I admire for his uh, shameless kitsch. And uh, so I thought I would... Um, put up a little gallery of Klimt here. So the famous kiss, uh, kiss on the left, and this uh, appropriate portrait of Wittgenstein's sister uh, in the middle, and um, death and life uh, on the right-hand side there. So now I'll move on. OK, now, did anybody notice the subliminal advertising in the previous uh, slide? <laughs> um, so you may have done, but in fact, it is complete coincidence that the cover of my book, uh, in fact, does... Um, uh, it is adorned by, uh, by a, a piece of Gustav Klimt. So I thought I'd just uh, would start off with that. Um, okay, so um, you might think that I'm going to defend the concept of artificial intelligence or the possibility of, of, art, of um, artificial consciousness, sorry. But in fact, uh, rather I'm thinking of what I'm going to do as, as rather as spelling out the conceptual and empirical territory somewhat. Um, so there's going to be quite a lot of technology and science in this talk, uh, and then a fair, bit of, uh, a fair bit of philosophy as well. So uh, the technology and science is mainly going to be discussing how we might copy a brain, and that's going to be uh, one of the main themes that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, and then there are various philosophical uh, topics or various philosophical uh, arguments and thoughts that I'm going to, going to uh, go through. Uh, and as I say at the bottom here, uh, at the very end, I will uh, uh, deliver my punchline, and I um, uh, would uh, ask that you don't anticipate my views on these matters until you see the, the punchline. Okay, now suppose that I were asked to construct, um, uh, construct an, some kind of artificial consciousness. Suppose that the research councils in the UK thought that this was a great way to pull us out of recession. Um, and uh, so uh, the, there are a number of different ways I might approach perhaps building a conscious artifact. Th and, and I can think of three rather distinct methods that I might, uh, that I might use. Um, so the first is to try and engineer the thing from scratch, as it were. And the second is to draw inspiration from nature and from uh, the brain sciences. And the third is so-called whole brain emulation. Uh, and most of what I'm going to be talking about in this lecture is whole brain emulation, which will be uh, a useful uh, way of, of looking into the philosophy of, of the possibility of artificial intelligence. Um, but I'm just going to very quickly talk about the other, these other methods in order to clarify exactly what I, what I mean here. So remember that there are these sort of three potential ways you might attempt to build a conscious artifact if somebody had given you that much money. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, so the first is engineering from scratch. So the, the rather cliched um, uh, analogy for this is that it's a little bit like, um, uh, like flight, like powered flight. And it may be that, uh, that the route to success um, is, is not so much to, uh, to imitate nature, but to, to rather to engineer things in a completely from, from first principles, uh, much as, uh, as happened in, in flight. So, of course, Leonardo da Vinci thought that we could build an ornithopter, and that might be a good way to, uh, to, to have uh, powered flight. And there's, there's this nice little picture on the left here. But in fact, it turned out that the right thing to do was not to, to use flapping wings, but to have a fixed wing aircraft with some kind of means of forward propulsion and, uh, uh, and so on. So that might be one way that you might try and try to build a conscious artifact in scare quotes. That kind of thing always comes in scare quotes, by the way, until the end of the lecture. 
Um, so the second approach um, is brain-inspired AI. So brain, you might take a brain-inspired approach. So here the idea would be to try to build a fundamental theory of, of consciousness, of how the brain works. Of course, that begs the question of the relationship between those things. Uh, and to engineer uh, some kind of artificial intelligence based on that theory, as in, for example, uh, nuclear fusion. In nuclear fusion, of, of course, it takes place in the, in the sun, in nature, and from nature we can build a fundamental theory of exactly how nuclear fusion works, and then we can apply that theory um, to, uh, to engineer um, a nuclear reactor, say. So that's just uh, an analogy. But I'm not going to consider either of those two possibilities. The possibility I'm going to uh, consider, because it, it, it uh, allows us to hone our philosophical thought experiments much more sharply, uh, is whole brain emulation, which I will uh, abbreviate to WBE sometimes. So if you see WBE and you've forgotten what it stands for, it's for whole brain emulation. And this is the basic idea. Can I use the other microphone as well? So is that, is that allowable? Yes, you get it. Hello. Okay. Um, because then, um, uh, then I can point to the screen, which I which I'd rather do actually. So the uh, the basic idea of whole brain emulation uh, is that we take a brain, we then take this this brain and we scan it in exquisite detail and not using this kind of scanner, and I'm gonna talk about the more serious uh, scanning technology that you might use. And uh, then you, you take your, your scan and use that to build uh, a kind of wiring diagram or a blueprint of the brain that you've got, the exact particular brain that you've got. Um, and you then take that, uh, that blueprint and you then, using massive amounts of computer power, you simulate the activity of all of those many millions of neurons uh, again, in exquisite uh, detail, and then the question then is, do we have something at the end that is conscious or that thinks? Well, the first, um, the very first thing that one um, might uh, point out is that is that uh, I, I certainly don't think that would work for one second because the very first thing that we need to do uh, is to embody this this emulation for this to be a, a, an even faintly plausible thought experiment as far as I'm concerned because certainly uh, cognition and intelligence, any of those categories that we, uh, terms that we like to, to use, I think really only make sense in the context of, of an embodied, um, uh, an Im of, of an embodied creature or an embodied thing anyway that interacts with the world and interacts with others as well. Uh, actually, in the um, uh, so, so, this, so this is depicted in this sort of somewhat modified picture. So here, the idea is that uh, we, pr we construct this exquisitely detailed uh, simulation of the brain and of the activity of every single neuron. And then we use that to actually control uh, a robot. So this brain uh, is, is, uh, is, t is taking uh, its input from the sensory apparatus of a, of a robot and uh, its motor uh, outputs are used to control the the legs and arms and fingers and so on of this robot. Now, I very deliberately used the most clunky possible robot that you can imagine here because I want to uh, emphasize the, rather the opposite, that in order for this to be at all plausible, of course, it's going to have to be, all of our robots today are just as clunky as this on the scale of clunkiness. And for this to, to work, it really would have to be a very, very much more exquisitely accurate type of, uh, of body that has uh, that is much more like a biological body. Uh, and notice also here I've included others with a capital O. There are other robots here. Uh, in my um, uh, uh, in earlier incarnations of this talk I just had one Robbie here but, uh, but of course that doesn't get the point across because of course we want there to be not necessarily many Robbies but others so they can be hu humans as well in particular. So then the question is would would the resulting thing uh, be conscious? So how would we want to talk about it? Okay, so um, now in order to pin this, this idea down, um, so uh, uh, Peter Hacker in, in, in uh, his talk, I think, said we, uh, we mustn't uh, allow our imaginations to run away with ourselves and to do too much science fiction. I, well, I actually quite like letting my imagination run, run away with itself, but just to show that this isn't quite as science fiction uh, as, as you might think, I want to go a little bit into some of the, uh, some of the technological challenges that are involved here. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the brain scanning technology uh, and a little bit about the neural simulation methods and a little bit about the necessary computer power and the robotics. So just, just a few minutes on each of those things. Okay. So first of all, the kind of scanner that I showed in that picture there is, is not even um, remotely plausible uh, as, a, as a technology for doing what I'm describing. Far more plausible is, uh, is this kind of thing. So this device here, um, which was uh, uh, designed and built by uh, Ken Hayworth in Harvard, um, is a machine that takes, um, takes a piece of uh, neural tissue and slices off very, very, very thin slices of this and puts them on a tape um, so that you've got this tape with all these uh, slices of tissue on. And then uh, this tape can then be uh, passed through a scanning electron microscope, which can then take pictures, uh, images, uh, and computerize these images of, uh, of these little tiny um, uh, slices of, of, of neural tissue. And if you want to do any piece of tissue of any size to this kind of accuracy, because this is looking down at the level of the individual neurons and synapses, um, then you want to be able to do this very rapidly. And this, this sort of slices, in, slices it up very rapidly and puts these uh, um, samples on, a, on, a, uh, on this tape. And then what you can do is with, these, uh, with all of these slices, which are then available to the computer, you can then reconstruct the circuitry involved, or the, 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 the neurons and their connections. And here I just want to show you a little piece of film. Um, which, uh, which is, um, and here I have to say thanks to Sebastian Sung at, uh, at MIT, who uh, has given me permission to use this piece of film. And actually, sorry, let me, let me just, just go back. So then you saw, what you saw at the beginning was somebody holding uh, actually a rather um, uh, a large circular plate with several pieces, uh, pieces of very thin tissue on. And we're now zooming in to, these, uh, 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 to a single tissue sample, a single slice. And you can see the kind of exquisite detail that you find if you use one of these scanning electron microscopes. So you can zoom uh, all the way in like that. Now, what you've actually got uh, are, in fact, a, a, a series of, like a stack of plates, uh, a series of these, um, uh, of these images. And what, you, what the computer needs to do, or what, or what the um, business of tracing through a particular, um, a particular axon or dendrite needs to do, is you need to follow it through each of these slices. So here, you, what you can see being colored is a particular axon, which you then need to trace through all the way down through this little block of, of tissues in order to get a, um, a reconstruction, uh, which is represented in detail in the computer, of exactly where that, that axon is going to and coming from. And here you see where it synapses uh, onto another, uh, another neuron. And uh, then what you need to do, of course, is you need to, uh, and this just shows the level of detail that we've got. So you've got, got it down to the individual vesicles that contain the neurotransmitters, which allows the syn uh, synaptic transmission. And of course, what you need to do is you need to do that for, not just for one axon through the, through the thing, but for, uh, for all of the, the, the axons in, in this slice. And as you see the little bit of video uh, carry on, you'll see, yes, you'll see exactly how densely packed in just that tiny, tiny, tiny sample, uh, how densely packed all of the crisscrossing axons and dendrite, dendrites are. Okay, so there we are. And that's, so that's what you need to be able to reconstruct in the computer. Okay, so, and that is an extremely tiny, tiny, tiny little slice. So that's the kind of thing that you would need, uh, that you would need to do. Let's come back to this. Okay, so the idea is that, uh, is that then so you want to be able to, to, to do that for an entire brain, an entire brain. And I should emphasize that I'm going to, for most of this talk, I'm going to emphasize the possibility of doing that, not for a human brain, but for the brain of a small animal. And I, and, and I invite you to think about the possibility of doing that for a mouse, uh, not for a human brain, but for doing that for a mouse. And, and I'm interested in the questions that that throws up. So, um, 
Okay, so that's the, something about the scanning technology. Now, of course, many of you know pretty well what neurons do, but just to, uh, just to sort of reiterate. Um, uh, so, so, of course, what neurons, uh, what neurons do is immensely complex, but in a, in a very uh, a glib description is that uh, neurons build up uh, a membrane potential. When their membrane potential reaches a certain value, then they emit a spike of, ele of, of, of electricity which travels uh, along uh, axons to, to other neurons. So we can, so if you do a single cell recording of a neuron, then you get, or of, of a little collection of four, four or five neurons, then you will get traces like this that show uh, the membrane potential, and then when the membrane potential reaches a certain point, then the neuron spikes and so on. Um, so that's, a, that's what neurons do. And then thanks to, um, to work, really uh, some uh, absolutely amazing work that Hodgkin and Huxley did in the 1950s, we have pretty good mathematical models of, of, uh, of what neurons do. Uh, and this little set of equations is not uh, um, Hodgkin and Huxley's equations. This is a, uh, a simplification of Hodgkin and Huxley's equations. But, uh, but the way we would build a neural simulation is by using those, kind, those equations, the equations that describe the electrical activity of a, uh, of a neuron. And what we do is we, we simulate, uh, in the computer we can simulate thousands, millions of neurons and, uh, that are all connected up to each other, and we sim sim simulate exactly what their electrical activity uh, is. And so we go from, uh, we, so we start off with a description of the, uh, uh, a mathematical description of the behavior of the neuron and its signaling properties. We have a description of exactly how the neurons are connected to each other, and then we put that into our uh, computer simulation and we can simulate the electrical uh, activity going on there. So then I have another movie clip here, I hope. Uh, where is it? Uh, and this is an animation of, uh, of a computer simulation of a relatively small number of neurons. And uh, you can see those neurons spiking. Whenever they spike, um, when the, the, the membrane potential is represented in red. And uh, the spike, when a neuron spikes, it emits a, a little red blob uh, along one of these, uh, these lines here, uh, along the, the, the connections. And that can trigger uh, you know, a cascade of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of spiking uh, elsewhere. So uh, now this is just an animation of what's going on in the computer. So in the computer, we've simulated uh, you know, exactly what, uh, what, what's going on here. Now this is, this is just a very small number of neurons, but it, we can, of course, imagine a very, very much larger simulation. And um, uh, this is, uh, so this is work that we've been doing at Imperial College um, to, to simulate large numbers of neurons on uh, accelerated uh, hardware. So that's one of the things that we, that, that we do. Okay, so, um, okay, so now, um, so the ch one of the challenges here, of course, is the fact that there are uh, very large numbers of neurons uh, in brains, and this is sort of roughly what we, uh, what we're, the sorts of numbers that we're looking at. So in a honeybee, we have a little bit, uh, uh, somewhat fewer than a million neurons in the brain of a honeybee. Uh, in the cortex of a mouse, um, so that's uh, excluding the um, cerebellum, which has many, uh, many more neurons, uh, but in the cortex, which of course many people think of as the, uh, as the important bit, there are about 10 million neurons. Uh, in a cat, about 300 million neurons, and I have absolutely no idea what my cat does with its 300 million neurons. <laughs> but it, supposedly it has 300 million. Uh, and then in, a, in human cortex, about 12 billion cortical neurons, and, and, and many more if you, if you include the cerebellum as well. Um, so if we uh, are to simulate a brain, then we need the computing power to simulate very large numbers of neurons. And the argument here appeals, of course, to Moore's law, which many of you will be familiar with. And Moore's law basically says that the, um, uh, the, the number of transistors that you can fit onto a, a, the same area of silicon on a chip uh, doubles roughly every 18 months. And this uh, law, which is, 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 is not a real, you know, it's not a physical law or anything, it's, but it's, it's a, a law that uh, describes uh, uh, quite accurately, has described technological progress. And this is held for, uh, for about 40 years. And, uh, and um, you'll notice that this is a logarithmic scale on the left here. So these, these counts are going, are really going up very rapidly. And this law still pretty much Holds. Now, the technology to maintain 
uh, this rate of, uh, of, of increase has to change. And at the moment, for those, for the, for, for those who are interested in the geeky details, then, uh, then, the, then where the, the action is in using massive parallelism as we find in graphics processes and so on. That's the kind of thing that we've been doing at Imperial to enable us to simulate larger and larger numbers of, uh, of, of neurons. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that we're, that we're doing. Now, also, another part of the technological challenge is, well, I showed you a very clunky robot, uh, uh, Robbie from the Fro Forbidden Planet, which, of course, is not even a real robot, uh, but a fictional one. But there is a good deal of work going on in, um, uh, to build much more, much more realistic robots, humanoid robot uh, uh, platforms. And, um, and, and, and I particularly draw your attention to uh, Eki Robot on the right here, uh, which was uh, built in a, uh, in a large European-funded project. The interesting thing about Eki Robot quite, is, is the fact that it has a very realistic muscular skeletal system. So the so the uh, the way it's built is it really does. Um, uh, 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 so the the term that they use is uh, anthropomimetic. It's an anthropomimetic robot because its construction very much is very similar to that of the human muscular skeletal system, other, as opposed to the kinds of, uh, 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 you know, steel and, uh, and, and gears construction that we find in a lot of other robots. So this kind of thing is, uh, is, is possible, and people are looking at soft robots and all of that, that, that sort of thing, and this is a, a direction in which people are going. This is also interesting because uh, this robot only has one eye, which makes it really scary. It looks like a skeleton, and it only has one eye. I mean, you really don't want to meet this thing in a dark alley, right? Um, Okay, uh, now well, one uh, last point I want to make is that uh, is that uh, in discussions of this kind of uh, kind of thing, people say, well, what's important about embodiment? And that you, you might there are many different kinds of things that you might think are important about embodiment. And what I think is important about embodiment uh, is the fact that you are interacting with a world of complex objects that have rich dynamics and shapes and so on, and of course you're interacting with others who are also interacting with the shared world. And to my mind, that's the important thing about embodiment. Uh, other people might uh, appeal to more biological uh, facts, such as our metabolism, more sort of visceral details of embodiment. But to my mind, what counts is this interaction with the shared world, the rich and complex shared world. Um, and uh, so, it, so on that basis, I don't have any objection in these kinds of thought experiments to the concept of virtual embodiment. So you can imagine embodying, in sort of, qu in sort of quotes, uh, this kind of simulation, this kind of uh, whole brain emulation in a, a virtual world. And in fact, this is probably uh, the least of the, of, the, of the technological demands because we can already build um, physics simulators uh, which are exquisitely realistic. And, um, uh, uh, and if any of you have ever tried out Second Life, um, then although that isn't very realistic, you'll know how immersive an experience it can actually be for us to, uh, to, to interact with that kind of world, as people do in video games as well, of course. Okay, um, so that's the kind of, uh, those, that's the kind of uh, technological um, challenges we have to this idea of whole brain emulation. Now, now I want to start to do a little bit of philosophy. Um, okay, so certainly the science and technology to simulate and embody a human brain does seem uh, very far off because the sheer numbers are involved are very large, uh, 20 billion or 12 billion cortical neurons and so on. But in fact, if we had the uh, scan data, if we ha had uh, that perfect scan of a mouse's brain, which we certainly don't have, and there are, there are projects that, uh, 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 to try and construct this, this kind of, well, it's not the actual scanning that's, uh, that's the challenge so much as taking the scan and turning that into a wiring diagram or a blueprint. So if we had that blueprint, um, then we could do a kind of uh, real-time mouse scale brain with today's technology, with 10 million cortical neurons. Now, we, only be, we would only be simulating those neurons to a certain level of physical detail, and it's an empirical question uh, of exactly uh, how important uh, that is. So I'll come back to that in a second. But here's the question that I want to uh, really discuss. So a real mouse, I would say, is surely conscious in some sense. And what I mean by that is that 
it's, is that I think a mouse is capable of suffering and uh, we have some kind of ethical duties towards, our, towards mice, even though they're simple creatures. We certainly uh, have ethical duties towards cats and uh, 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 despite uh, his passivity, I feel a very strong ethical duty towards my cat. Um, and I think the same is true of mouse, uh, of mice. We uh, we'll feel a kind of revulsion at the idea of torturing a mouse. Um, uh, laboratory experiments with mice have a certain kind of yuck factor for, for, for many of us, and I think that we do have a duty towards a mouse. So, the, so the, the, the question is, suppose we built one of these embodied, an embodied mouse upload. So this term upload is, the, is another term that people who are interested in this kind of thing use for a whole brain uh, emulation. So suppose we built an embodied mouse uh, upload. Would it be like something to be that mouse? And would that emulated, embodied emulation um, be capable of suffering as well? Well, you know, the first gut reaction to this, this is, uh, well, of course not, a ridiculous idea. This is just a computer simulation, and, um, uh, you know, of course it wouldn't be uh, capable of suffering, and, and, and so on. But I want to challenge that first intuition uh, that you might have. And uh, in order to do that, we're going to explore, explore a little bit more uh, the empirical territory and, and, and learn, look at some of the conceptual territory. So one assumption I do want to make here is causal closure. And this is a, a, an assumption that has, 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 has been a th sort of theme of this conference, actually. So I will assume that there is no uh, mysterious non-physical causation in the chain of events that mediates between sensation and uh, action uh, in a mouse. So in other words, if we know uh, what comes into the, to the, uh, to the brain of the mouse, we know, uh, we know what uh, electrical signals uh, uh, are coming from its retina, say, from, or from, um, uh, from its optic nerve, uh, then, we can, uh, then, then there is no mi causal mystery uh, between uh, what comes in there and the uh, uh, spikes that control the, the muscles of the, of the mouse. So that's an assumption that I want to, uh, to make. And of course, you might reject that assumption, which would be fine. OK, so now given that assumption, would our embodied uh, mouse upload uh, be conscious? And uh, I, actually, I, I meant to put that question in scare quotes, um, because I'm really just sort of exploring it, and, uh, and, and the question itself begs quite a lot. Quite a lot. So here's a thought experiment, uh, which is due, really due to uh, to John Searle, and has been explored more extensively by uh, by David Chalmers. So so imagine this. So this is a uh, um, uh, moving sideways a little bit. We're not looking at quite the same scenario that we've been looking at at the moment, but I think you'll see that it's a it's a a directly analogous scenario. So suppose that we could replace an individual neuron uh, in our mouse's brain, or indeed in a human brain, with an exact, e exactly equivalent artificial device. So say we take this neuron here, uh, then we, we uh, sort of uh, surgically remove it from, from the, the, the system, and we replace it instead with an artificial equivalent that has exactly the same signaling properties as that, as that neuron. Perhaps it works uh, by simulating the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, or perhaps some more sophisticated version of them, and so on. So it's got all of the uh, um, uh, incoming uh, synapses here. Uh, the, all of their signals are going to be converted and then, uh, and then processed by this artificial version, and it's going to um, uh, uh, emit spikes in exactly the same way that, uh, that the neuron that it's replacing emitted spikes. OK, suppose that we can do that. Then um, if the artificial neuron is indeed equivalent in terms of its uh, signaling properties to the one it replaces, then we would expect the replacement to make no difference uh, to the behavior of the animal. And now, OK, let's, let's suppose, let's accept that. Now suppose that we begin to replace more and more neurons. So we replace them, the neurons, one by one until eventually there are no originals uh, left. So we're gradually replacing all of the neurons. Now, by hypothesis, or by the assumption, the animal will continue to behave exactly uh, as before. It'll be behaviorally equivalent. So now the question is, 
what would happen to its consciousness? And I put this in scare quotes because we might want to challenge the very conceptual framework of the question and so on, but this is certainly, I find this a philosophically tempting question to ask. What would happen to its consciousness? So let's go with that question. So if we go with that question, then it seems to me, and this is the, the kind of analysis that's, that uh, Chalmers goes through, it seems to me that there are really only three possibilities. Either it suddenly disappears, the consciousness suddenly disappears when uh, some threshold of neurons is replaced, uh, leaving a, a zombie mouse that behaves in, in, a, in this, uh, in this uh, just as before, but you know, there's no one at home, or not no one, but there's no consciousness there. It doesn't feel anything, there's no phenomenology, let's say. Um, that's one possibility, the gradual threshold. So, you, you know, you get to uh, four million neurons and four million and one and click, you know, the light goes off. Um, okay, so that's one uh, possibility, let's imagine. Another one is that, the, is that consciousness gradually fades. The more neurons that we replace, then although the mouse is behaving in exactly the same way, the light inside, if I may use that metaphor, because this sort of uh, appeals, gradually dims. Or finally, there's the possibility that the consciousness persists throughout this, this process. Now, I don't know what your first, uh, if for those who haven't encountered this thought experiment before, what your first feelings are about, about that. But, uh, well, I mean, I have to say that I find the, uh, uh, the, su the sudden disappearance a very counterintuitive possibility, so I tend to kind of uh, re reject that outright. Um, the gradual fading um, scenario has some, uh, you know, does have some, some force. So, uh, so let's look at that. And in fact, Searle uh, thinks that this is, uh, you know, thinks that this is a very, that this is a realistic uh, possibility that consciousness would gradually fade. And so Searle, in discussing this, now he's thinking about doing this with a human being, not with a mouse. So, it's, so there's a little bit of a shift here. But imagine that we do this with a, with a human, that this was done with a human being. And this, this is what Searle says. As the silicon is progressively implanted into your dwindling brain, you find that the area of your conscious experience is shrinking, but that this shows no effect on your external behavior. You find, to your total amazement, that you are indeed losing control of your external behavior. You find, for example, that when the doctors test your vision, you hear them say, we are holding up a red object in front of you. Please tell us what you see. You want to cry out, I can't see anything, I'm going totally blind. But you hear your voice saying in a way that is completely out of your control, I see a red object in front of me. So this is how Searle attempts to uh, characterize what it would be like if consciousness gradually faded. Now, I don't know if you find Searle's characterization very persuasive. Uh, I don't find it remotely persuasive. I think it's an extremely odd description indeed. And in case you don't find it odd as it is, just imagine reversing this process. So imagine gradually putting the neurons, uh, the original biological neurons, back in, replacing the silicon ones, uh, ones one by one. So then all of this is going to go backwards. So, so from being this sa rather sad, locked-in uh, subject who, uh, who is, uh, has no control over his behavior, and yet there's somehow a witness to it all, um, then, then this is all meant to, to, to go backwards. But the very bizarre thing is at the end of the, the reversed process, um, he then has to say, well, actually, it all seemed fine. I didn't notice anything go amiss at all, because by hypothesis, the behavior of this, uh, of this person or this experiment, thought experiment person uh, is unchanged. So. So what happens to this little locked-in individual that, that, we, that, that we end up with in the, in, in the end? Um, so that's, uh, uh, so that's uh, what I'm expressing in this, uh, in this next uh, side, slide. So, so this gradual fading option really doesn't persuade me uh, at all either, I have to say. And I'm left thinking that the persisting consciousness scenario is the most uh, persuasive one. Okay, so that's the sort of, uh, uh, let's say, an intermediate point in the, th in the thinking. Uh, the, the, the persisting consciousness is the most persuasive scenario. Now, first of all, I, now I want to uh, uh, investigate some 
uh, objections to this. So first of all, I, I want to uh, look at some empirical objections. And some of these are perfectly valid empirical objections. So, uh, so somebody might say, well, actually, you, you wouldn't get any kind of behavioral, behavioral equivalence. And of course, some, uh, the fact that the idea that this product is behaviorally indistinguishable from the original is a hypothesis of this, uh, is an assumption of this argument. So why might that not be uh, uh, right? Well, the physical fidelity of this emulation might be inadequate. And so people will uh, ask about, for example, glial cells. I haven't talked really about neurotransmitters, about the chemistry involved. Um, and there's a whole lot of other um, uh, details about the actual you know, underlying neurophysiology that you might bring up uh, and point out that hasn't been discussed in my emulation scenario. Um, well, that's all fine, uh, but I think we can extend the thought experiment, at least as a thought experiment, but it comes less, perhaps less practical. We can extend the thought experiment to include pretty much all of the stuff that you want to bring on board. Well, with some exceptions. I'll come down to that at the end. Okay, you might say only structure uh, is preserved in this uh, emulation, and uh, the ongoing electrical activity is, is, really, is really important. And if this ongoing electrical activity isn't preserved, then, uh, then, you know, the, then, uh, then this scenario is hopeless. But in fact, that is uh, empirically false, in fact, because um, there is a procedure called deep hypothermic uh, circulatory arrest, which is used in patients who have to have very delicate brain surgery in which their, their blood temperature is lowered gradually to, um, to just a, a few degrees centigrade, I think about nine or 10 degrees centigrade, and then their blood circulation is actually arrested altogether, and then there are about 30 minutes during which the surgeon can carry out some very delicate brain surgery, um, and during this time, there is cerebral silence, e electrical, there is absolutely no EEG at all. There's no uh, ongoing electrical activity. But nevertheless, these patients um, can be uh, uh, revived from, from this, this procedure, um, and uh, all of their memories are intact, all of their cognitive faculties. Well, of course, occasionally, sadly, something does go wrong, or it doesn't, but, but, uh, but it certainly is possible for them uh, to, to, to be uh, revived and to be perfectly healthy and normal as a result of it all. Another objection is that you need uh, quantum effects, as uh, Penrose, Roger Penrose might maintain, or you might object that you need real valued uh, quantities here, because of course physics is, uh, is allegedly uh, all about real numbers as opposed to uh, discrete numbers, which is all we can really so what we can really do in a simulation is to approximate real numbers. And that, uh, I have to say, is, is not an unreasonable objection if you want to go that way. Uh, you might say that you need, uh, you actually need metabolism or biology. And of course, this is not a living thing. And actually, it's the real viscera that, that, that really is important that makes it a living thing. Well, I, I have to say that, to my mind, that simply seems like a prejudice. And there isn't any real uh, evidence, I don't think that that is the case. When we're looking, just looking at the idea that we can build something that is behaviorally equivalent. Um, okay, so just uh, looking at some of those objections. Okay, now, now I want to move on to a slightly different topic, because now I want to, st to, to think about, uh, about the human case. So I've invited you to think about uh, the case of a mouse. And of course, in the case of a mouse, there are a couple of interesting things. The first, of, first thing is that it is certainly a lot more empirically plausible, uh, or, or technologically plausible rather, that we could actually build one of these things. And I suspect, um, uh, uh, and Parachev might disagree because I know that you were talking about the complexity of, of doing this kind of thing, but I suspect that we will be able to build uh, a behaviorally equivalent embodied whole brain emulation of a mouse within my lifetime. I would be surprised if that were not the case, but it may, may not be the case. But then let's think about, um, uh, about the human case. So imagine that we could do this in the case of human beings. Well, um, okay, so let's suppose that you accept this, uh, uh, that, you, that you've, you've, you've absorbed this thought experiment and you've accepted that, uh, that consciousness is preserved. Of these three scenarios, you believe that consciousness is preserved in this embodied whole brain uh, emulation. And this is a kind of, kind of conservative functionalism. Uh, it's conservative functionalism because, because, of course, you're preserving the function in a very specific way. You're actually, uh, actually reproducing the function of 
individual neurons. So you're preserving a lot of the way the thing works, as it were. Uh, now, suppose that you extend this conclusion uh, to the human case. So an appropriately embodied human uh, whole brain emulation uh, would be conscious. And of course, this is a leap because we have episodic memory, and you may argue about whether those, uh, those things are going to be preserved. I expect Ray will uh, challenge me on that one. Um, but let's, uh, let's take that, uh, that leap for now, because I want to explore some other issues. Um, so so the, the question that I'm interested in is, suppose your brain were uploaded into an embodied whole brain emulation, um, would that constitute uh, personal survival? And in case you think this is just a purely theoretical question, there are people, primarily, I think, um, uh, uh, tech billionaires in California, who are willing to pay large sums of money to have their bodies uh, cryogenically preserved uh, in the uh, hope and expectation that in um, decades or maybe centuries to come, uh, that either medical technology will reached a point where their bodies can be, uh, can be revived, or perhaps some kind of procedure like I've just described, whole brain emulation, will be feasible in the human brain case, and, and they, can, uh, they can be re resurrected into, uh, uh, into a post-singularity technological utopia. So you may think that this is, a, uh, that this is just a thought experiment, um, and, uh, but you know, people are taking these kinds of decisions with their money. So it's, uh, it's worth uh, discussing, I think. So, if, uh, so let's uh, suppose that this, uh, you accept the thought experiment with the mouse and you ex ac accept that con there's some kind of preservation of consciousness uh, in that process, then what would happen in the, in the human case? And in particular, uh, would, um, uh, would, the, would it constitute personal survival? So this is the, this is the basic sort of uh, a scenario, which I call vanilla resurrection. So let's call this one vanilla resurrection. So the idea is that uh, Murray dies, uh, is preserved in one of the cryogenically in one of these uh, 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 canisters at the, for very low temperatures, as close as possible to absolute zero, and so on. And then uh, eventually technology advances to such a point where we can produce a, a destructive scan. It's a destructive scan because it's going to, you know, there's going to be nothing left of the brain after this is done. So you've got, you're not going to bring the biological brain back to life. So you produce a destructive scan. I, I, the, here's a little collection of very old-fashioned floppy disks here. <laughs> now, you'd need quite a large number of these old-fashioned floppy disks. Uh, you know, it would probably, uh, you know, who, heaven knows how many warehouses it would fill uh, to, to, to do enough data. But of course, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, in a way, I pick old-fashioned technology for these icons because that emphasizes the fact that this moves very rapidly forward, and we can, in fact, put you know, enormous amounts of data. We can store enormous amounts of data these days, and that also is increasing in a Moore's law-like exponential way. So we do a destructive scan, and then you know, we build this whole brain emulation, uh, and, we, uh, and we embody it, uh, perhaps for real, in some kind of robot body, but very human-like robot body, or uh, maybe in some kind of uh, virtual reality that is populated with other, other guys who've been resurrected in this vanilla fashion. Um, okay, so now uh, let's suppose that people submit to this procedure and that it appears to work in the set, so this is the behavioral equivalence assumption. So the behavior of the, of the resurrected person, in quotes, um, uh, is, uh, is indistinguishable um, from, uh, from the behavior of, of the original. And they protest that nothing has changed, they feel absolutely fine. Of course, this is again, is part of this, this uh, assumption of behavioral equivalence. They say, absolutely fine, I'm really glad I did this. You know, it was worth every penny, I feel great, you know, I'm really glad to be back, and so on. And, uh, and uh, all of their, um, uh, their wife and uh, children and family and friends, they all say, oh, yeah, it's great to have Murray back. They've all been resurrected also into this sort of post-singularity utopia, and think, yeah, you know, it's great, here we all are. Uh, lovely. Um, and so now, does this really constitute personal survival? Well, we can challenge th this sense that it might. And uh, maybe some of you are familiar with these kinds of scenarios that Derek Parfit discussed in Reasons and Persons. So this is one of Parfit's teleportation uh, examples. So this is another thought experiment. But of course, in, it, it's a much, you know, I think it's a somewhat less uh, plausible 
technological scenario, but that doesn't matter for the thought experiment. So the, uh, the idea is that um, in his, his thought experiments in reasons and persons, then you scan, uh, so this is a sort of Star Trek type teleportation. So you scan the person, uh, you, uh, you, um, uh, then, uh, you, then you can transmit data about the, uh, about the, the constitution of, this, uh, of, of the person to a far off place where you make a copy and then you destroy the original at the same time. And, uh, uh, and uh, in true uh, Captain Kirk fashion, you know, he can say, beam me up, Scotty, and when he's beamed up, he sort of says, you know, he doesn't say, uh, oh, I'm not Captain Kirk anymore or anything strange like that. So uh, the idea is that, uh, is that this uh, appears to work. But uh, you can challenge this, the intuition that, you, that, that this works with this kind of uh, fission scenario. So where you scan and uh, you actually make two copies. So two copies of, uh, of Murray here. And, uh, oh no, sorry, no, no. This, this, the scenario is where you make one copy of Murray and you re retain the original. And then you wait around for a bit and then you destroy the original. Well, you know, you might have a bit of trouble persuading the original at this point that it's okay for him to be destroyed. So, so no, it's all right, you're not here actually, you're down there and it's fine, you know, uh, zap. Uh, I, I, you know, the uh, uh, Murray might be reluctant to submit to this procedure. Um, but, you know, the question really is, at this point here, you know, where is Murray, right? As in, where's Waldo, you know, when you're trying to uh, find Waldo in one of these pictures. And, um, and again, I put this, this question in scare quotes because um, uh, I think it begs a lot of things. But, uh, but, but you can ask that question, and it does challenge the feeling that, uh, uh, that, that, that this is, makes sense. Um, okay, so you can imagine exactly this kind of fission scenario uh, as well in the case of these whole brain emulations. So here's Murray. Murray dies. He's preserved. We do one of these destructive scans. Ta-da! nice collection of floppy disks, um, and then you build two whole brain emulations. Well, now you say, um, you might ask, where is Murray? But in fact, there's a more pressing question in a way, or a more poignant question, or a question that, that begs less in the way of, of metaphysics, which is simply, would you submit to such a procedure? And you, know, you might say to yourself, um, uh, and, you know, you can die anyway, right? So, uh, so you, you, you might think to yourself, well, okay, uh, maybe it constitutes personal survival, maybe it doesn't, but, you know, I might as well, because I'm going to die anyway, and this is, this is going to be permanent otherwise. Uh, you know, religious um, convictions notwithstanding. So you might say, okay, I'll go for it. I'll, I'll, I'll be preserved, and there'll, there'll be a destructive scan. But this, and, and the possibility that there might be two of me uh, produced at the end, well, okay, you know, big deal, so maybe it's even better, you know, uh, there's, there's two of me, so it's just double survival or something, right? Um, so you may say that, but then consider this possibility. Suppose uh, that uh, you have the death and, and preservation, you have the destructive scan, ta-da, nice collection of floppy disks and with all the relevant information, and now two of these things are, are, are created, two of these embodied whole brain, brain uh, emulations. One in a kind of post-singularity heaven where you have all the research grants you want and lots of uh, postdocs to do your uh, every bidding and, uh, and, and, and another one in post-singularity hell which is dominated by administrators who want you to fill in forms and so on. Okay? So, so there, are these two, there are these two versions. Right? Now, would you, uh, of course, to make this re really convincing you have to make it genuinely hellish, right? I know that is genuine here, but I mean really, really hellish. So this, uh, is t this, this one is tortured, and this one has a li life of well, whatever you like. Enlightenment, hedonism, whatever you want. Um, OK. Now, would you submit to that? Now, that's the, uh, that's the question. So here are your, your options. You know you're going to die anyway, uh, but you don't know exactly how you're going, you know, what's going to happen to you if you're, quotes, quotes, resurrected. OK. So this is all very... Uh, perhaps very puzzling. Or, and I was, oh yes, I was just going to say that, 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 so that, so this, what I've just described actually was um, published uh, by, so uh, David Chalmers just a couple of years, or last, a couple of years ago, published these thoughts with respect to this up, these uploading scenarios based on Parfit's scenarios. But in fact, I have a prior claim. 
from my adolescent notebooks when I was 17, when I described exactly this scenario in 1982. And the moral of that is publish or perish. Uh, okay, uh, but that's uh, a little bit beside the point. I'm going to skip, actually, um, one of the little thought experiments I wanted to, to do. No, actually, I, can, I think I can... No, I'm going to skip one of them because I want to talk about zombies, part-time zombies. Okay, so this is yet another one of these, uh, of these uh, thought experiments, which I think is kind of philosophically challenging. So, um, so suppose, that in, in this case, I'm going to ask you to imagine that, uh, that it's one of these upload scenarios into uh, some kind of virtual reality. So suppose a person is uploaded into one of these whole brain emulations, is endowed with a, a virtual a virtual body and situated in a virtual world, so, it's, so, so they're in a kind of simulation. Uh, now, let's suppose that we could build a zombie equivalent of the whole brain emulation. So maybe you're, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Kirk's notion of a philosophical zombie who is a an ident physically identical twin of a person but for whom there is no light on inside, they have no phenomenology and so on. Now this is not quite that kind of zombie, it's uh, a slightly different zombie because we, we're, I, you can make it, it doesn't have to be uh, 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 exactly physically in, uh, identical to the original, uh, nor indeed does it have to be a whole brain emulation. It just has to be behaviorally equivalent to the original. So, uh, so the arguments that I've advanced so far rely on the fact that you, you're gradually transforming, or you can imagine gra gradually transforming the biological original into uh, a behavioral equivalent. But suppose you could build a behavioral equivalent that was clearly not, had no phenomenology. So, so let's suppose that you think that that's the case. Um, and then let's imagine a kind of scenario where for a short time, say one minute, this whole brain emulation is, is, is switched off and the zombie equivalent takes over. So you have the same uh, simulated body and the, the emulation is, is turned off and the zombie equivalent system comes in instead. And then that controls what's going on for, for one minute, and then that's turned off, and you go back to the original whole brain emulation. Okay, so, uh, so what would happen to the person's uh, consciousness if that were the case? So this is the kind of, uh, uh, kind of scenario. And in fact, you don't have to demand a virtual uh, simulation for, this, this, for this, uh, this to work. So you've got the, the whole brain uh, emulation is sort of is what's controlling your body up to 1059, and then you kind of switch that out altogether, and then, it's, then control of your body is taken over by the zombie equivalent system, and then the whole brain emulation is switched on again afterwards. Now, there seems to be here an episode of phenomenological absence, where uh, there's just, uh, uh, you know, the, the, again, behavior is preserved throughout. At the end of this, uh, this point here, the, uh, um, the person, in quotes, uh, maintains that nothing's changed, he feels absolutely fine, felt fine throughout the, the, the process. Family and friends say, uh, well, we didn't notice any difference. And again, this is the, behavior, the assumption of be behavioral e equivalence. Um, uh, if we allow a virtual embodiment, then we can actually really imagine constructing one of these things in a way, because what we do is we have this uh, whole brain emulation uh, running. Uh, sorry, not that one. We have this whole brain emulation uh, running. We then actually record all of the motor outputs of the, of the whole brain emulation during this one minute. We then allow, because it's a computer simulation, to just run the whole thing over again from scratch. And here, we just script the outputs of this, of this whole brain uh, uh, emulation. So it's just, just simply completely blindly performing the actions that this original did. So here we really feel that we ought to have an episode of of epistemological absence. Okay, now in my book I discuss this not in the context of, of uh, in the context of the original concept of a, of, of a philosophical zombie, rather whole brain emulation. And this is the, uh, the sort of where this leads to, I think. So, so by assumption, this person, re person in quotes, reports no effects either during or after the switchover, uh, and their family and friends report uh, no nothing. So suppose that the, the person determines to find out whether they have periods of phenomenological absence. They say, well, how do I know that I'm not a zombie some of the time? How do I know that I'm 
that, you know, that, that this isn't happening to me. How could they do it? Well, suppose they undertake to ask themselves, am I conscious, right? Am I conscious right now? This is Sue Blackmore's question, in case you've uh, read her lovely book, Ten Zen Questions. And you uh, resolve to ask yourself that question at various times in the day, and, and if, you're, if you're conscious and you're there, then you mark a diary with a letter L to say that, uh, um, uh, to say that you're there. And, uh, but the thing is, the problem is that, of course, later when you consult the diary to, to, to confirm that you had no periods of, of, uh, uh, of um, phenomenological absence, well, of course, you can't trust any of these marks because the zombie would have put exactly the same marks down as well. So you simply cannot trust anything that you write in your diary to, to, to note phenomenological presence uh, or, or, or absence. So, so, you know, the skeptical question then, of course, is, well, how do you know that your entire life up to this moment wasn't one of, of zombiehood? And do, indeed, we can ask this question without appealing to these science fiction type scenarios. Uh, um, and the reason I think that the science fiction scenarios have some uh, extra force is because they don't appeal to uh, conceivability. And if you know that literature, there's a lot of discussion about whether we can really conceive uh, of these scenarios or not, whether they're really imaginable and so on. But here we're talking about an empirical possibility uh, and uh, um, uh, not merely logical possibilities. So, you know, so, so that's the skeptical question. How do you know that your entire life up to this point isn't one of, uh, isn't one of phenomenological absence? And if it was, well, you know, would it matter? I mean, there's a sort of disturbing uh, question. So, in a sense, it seems that the conscious moment you have right now is, is, is all you have, and that's it. Well, if you find that kind of conclusion unpalatable, and if you feel that you've been led up a very peculiar, philosophically peculiar garden path that's led you to disturbing and strange conclusions, well, perhaps you, you might want to revisit some of the earlier conclusions or some of the argument, or, or perhaps we've reached a philosophical impasse, and this is where I come to sort of the, the punchline. So I think that we, in fact, inherit a very strong uh, intuition that when it comes to these questions of consciousness, and personal identity, and so on, that there are facts of the matter grounded in metaphysics. It's very hard to resist the, the feeling that there should be an answer to the question, do I survive this uploading process? Either I do or I don't. And if you think the question is ill-formed, well, just suppose that you were told, you know, you, you've given the decision, do you walk into that scanner or not? So it really becomes a very um, poignant question at that moment. Um, and um, I don't think, however, that analytic philosophy is actually very good at yielding these uh, supposedly suppo facts that are supposedly grounded in, in metaphysics. So despite our strong intuition that there should be such metaphysical facts about consciousness and personal identity and so on, you know, they are not forthcoming. I, I venture. And indeed, I think philosophical investigations of exotic empirical possibilities are one way um, uh, of undermining our intuition that, that there are any such, such facts. So where does that leave the concept of a, of a person uh, if, there is, if there is no metaphysical grounding to personhood or, or to consciousness? Well, okay, so this is where this, you might see a sudden jump from the kind of science fiction spouting geek that you think that you've been listening to, to something a little different. Because I, uh, my uh, ultimate take on this, which I describe in really in chapter one of the book that I, that I advertised shamelessly at the beginning. Um, uh, so there I take uh, inspiration particularly from the later Wittgenstein and uh, also t from the Zen Buddhist uh, tradition. Uh, and, uh, and, and taking inspiration from those sources, the challenge I see uh, here is to shed the habit of metaphysical thinking. And these troubling empirical uh, possibilities, as well as material that we find in, the, say, the philosophical investigations, like the private language remarks, I think they contribute to a therapeutic working through of our philosophical uh, uh, difficulties, and which facilitates a transition um, from uh, a reflective condition where we have these difficulties to a post-reflective condition uh, in which they are somewhat, in which they are dissolved, which is reminiscent of uh, apophatic um, uh, uh, traditions in certain, uh, certain uh, religions. And so much of that is described in chapter 
one of my book. So I will leave it there with another shameless plug for the, for the book. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you very much. This was a very stimulating talk. Um, of course, what um, Mary didn't reveal to us is that Imperial College is much more advanced in this type of uh, simulation than you thought, and that, in fact, they applied it to him. And so um, he seems to be quite conscious and confirms his own intuitions. Um, I trust that there will be many, many questions here. Um, so who wants to start? Shall I walk around with I the should, microphone? I should point out that it's much cheaper for Imperial College to send an emulation than to send the, <laughs> the real thing. So, um. Thank you. I, I used to love Star Trek, and um, that was a wonderful, uh, very exciting talk. Um, I must admit, shedding the habit of metaphys metaphysical thinking will probably turn us into zombies far, far faster than the whole brain emulation. Um, so I really want to defend metaphysics. Um, got no problem with matter replacement. That happens all the time anyway. We're changing the atoms of our bodies. Why can't we change the neurons? No problem with that. Okay. No problem with form separability um, from the body and resurrection. Heck, that's part of my religious tradition as well. Um, and, um, but my, I do have problems with the physics. And this is the issue. And I, I think you just glossed over this a little bit too fast. So here's some things you can't simulate very easily. You can't simulate fluids. Um, we're enjoying this uh, atrocious summer. The Met Office failed to predict this uh, atrocious summer because um, we don't predict um, fluid um, behaviors very well. There are a lot of fluids in the brain. It's squidgy stuff. It's not just elect clean electronics. Um, you can't simulate properly a three-body system. You can approximate and hope you don't have exponential divergences. You cannot simulate properly the smallest stable composite structure, the proton. We spend years on supercomputers trying to do it because there are vicious feedback effects. And I think you're... I mean, it's very beautiful. I, I love the, um, the display of the neurons firing, but it kind of bypasses the fact neurons are physical things. They're, they're touching up, they're bumping one another, they're, they're, they're growing, they're squidgy. Um, it almost looks a bit too clean, and um, I think there might be causal elements that are being missed by the abstraction. I don't want to be too discouraging, but the, the physics, I think, is more challenging than, um, than might appear. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I noticed that you uh, segued there between prediction and simulation, and and of course it's it's true that we can't predict fluids in the way that we can't predict uh, the, the the climate precisely and so on. Uh, nevertheless, we can construct simulations, and the simulations themselves are not going to accurately predict, but they are going to be if if you are sitting. Uh, playing a computer game, then they're going to be indistinguishable pretty much from, from the real thing. Well, they, and and we, they become more and more sophisticated as, uh, as time goes on. And I think that indistinguishability uh, is sufficient for, uh, for the kinds of arguments that, 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 that I'm uh, presenting here, both in the case of a simulated environment and I suspect in the case of the, uh, of the neurons themselves. Of course, the neurons, uh, there's, there's not the smallest doubt uh, I, I think that, uh, that the brain is a chaotic system and that the, 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 the very smallest perturbation can, uh, you know, in, in butterfly effect fashion can, can lead to very large, uh, large changes. But never, uh, but, and, and, and of course we can, build, we can build a chaotic system in the computer as well, which has the same unpredictability. But I wouldn't expect um, to build something that has state for state uh, you know, identity with the, uh, with the behavior you would have got from the original. But it has to be behaviorally indistinguishable, really, to the family and friends, I think. That's the, uh, that's the kind of the acid test, I think. Ray McDevitt, Hi. And you just sort of appealed, as it were, to the identity of indiscernibles. But, of course, it depends on how discerning your discerner is in order to decide whether, or at least it, it would mean seem to make identity depending on how discerning the discerner is. But it seems to me, and we've discussed this, Mary, that, that taking the experiment as it applies to a human being, you're, you're, as it were, trying to create some sort of Xerox copy of the brain. And the question is, what are you copying? And clearly you're copying more than the structure, more than the wiring. But if you are copying more than the wiring, then you've got to copy the wiring in some state of activity. Uh, and if you're doing it over successive times, of course those states could be actually in conflict. I mean, my brain, my visual pathway is behaving one way when I'm looking to the left, another way when I'm looking to the right. 
Now, your argument against that is you could actually freeze the whole system, and you referred to deep hypothermia. But of course, in deep hypothermia, the whole brain doesn't shut down. You've still got some electrical activity. It just happens to be beyond the range of the reach of the EEG. So you really have to have the brain as a going concern in order, as it were, to be able to uh, build it up. Even if you did manage to overcome that problem, you would then have a problem which you refer to of episodic memory because your simulated object, every single one of its memories, if you have memories, would be a total fake because they have, wouldn't have been arrived at by the usual causal pathways. And uh, it seems to me that the sum, to have the sum total of fake memories, particularly when they would have been drawn from the brain at different times when the simulation process was done, I think that is a serious barrier to feeling that you've replicated that individual. I put that very badly, but I hope somebody gets through. Yeah. Um, okay, so on the subject of the, um, of the cerebral silence, of course, this is a, a, it really is an empirical matter, whether, as you say, there may be, electric, there may be electrical activity beyond the reach of the EEG, uh, and it's really an empirical matter, I think, of whether, it, whether that actually makes any difference. If there, if there were literal uh, electrical silence, whether that, you know, whether that would make any difference. That's an empirical question, so, um, uh, you know, so it, remains, it remains to be seen. On the subject of the memories, well, I, you know, I can, of course, uh, uh, advance the, uh, the, the skeptical question, well, how do you know that your, all of your memories right now are, are, are not a good? Actually, I was going to start off with this thing with, by, by, by with the, this, the thought that, um, that, that, uh, that uh, when I woke up this morning, well, last night, I was, I was thinking, you know, God, how can, I, how can I make my book, you know, more visible? And then I woke up this morning. I woke up this morning to find on, on the Google front page uh, that their doodle was this Klimt uh, thing, telling me that today today was the 150th anniversary of the of the birthday of Gustav Klimt. Uh, and so I, mean, I saw this as clear evidence for the existence of God, because <laughs> he clearly had heard my prayer from the night before, and had today made today the the birthday of Gustav Klimt. Now, how would God do this? Well, of course, God, God is, is, is omnipotent, so, so he can change every record in every library in the world so that the... Because so, Gustav Klimt wasn't really born today, you know. Uh, if, if you'd looked yesterday, you would have found that, that his birthday was actually... You know, he's actually 148 years old, and he was born on the 11th of January. But, you know, God very kindly has changed it for me so I can advertise my book, having heard my prayer. So how would he, he can go around, he can change all of the dates in every library in the world, he can change every memory of every Klimt scholar so that, so that they think that, uh, that today is the day. Well, how would we know? How would we know that it was any different? And would it, would it matter? Well, we can say the same, exactly the same thing about your memories. So you don't really know whether they're fake or not, and, 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 uh, and, and would it matter? Well, sorry? But it's but you're not in any different uh, you're you're not in any different situation uh, epistemologically I think to the to the situation we're all in really fundamentally now I'm, I I mean I don't take that as a kind of terminus philosophically I take that as a provocation uh, which which uh, um, uh, to me suggests that we might abandon this whole habit of metaphysical thinking about all of these things including our memories actually. All right, next question is here. Hi, y yes, I think, oh, yeah, sorry, I had to launch the output. Um, I think that, that example of the, of the memory is quite an interesting one. It's also, it's like saying, if I would tell you now that you came into existence with all your ideas and memories a second earlier, how do you prove me wrong? I think it's, you know, it's the same thing. But in relation to um, the question of technology, I have two questions. And the first one I'm, I'm thinking, I can't help but think of Marshall McLuhan and his concept of um, the extension of the self through technology. Um, and I was thinking, if one interacts with technology or with a robot, does one interact with the robot or through the robot? Um, it's like, for example, if I get into my car, if someone bumps into me, it's not into my car, but it's into me. So if I'm on the computer on Facebook, do I interact with the computer or do I interact with the person on Facebook? And um, then my another question would be is that it seems that um, we still tend to look at technology um, and the human as a subject-object relationship. So technology is an object that we try to emulate into a subject. But 
would it be possible to take technology on itself, say for example, and construct a robot that does not necessarily copy a person, but a robot that is a robot on its own, that does not <coughs> sorry, emulate or simulate a person, but is a robot as a person is a person. I don't know if, if that question makes sense. Yeah, okay, so, so the, first, uh, uh, the first question I think uh, alluded to this notion of the extended mind, right? Where, where our mind extends into the, the tools we use and so on. And, uh, uh, and certainly I do feel that I have, uh, you know, I have outsourced a certain amount of my, of my mind to my inbox, actually. And, uh, you know, maybe a lot of us feel, feel this way. Um, now, I, but when I say something like that, I, I don't, I'm not sure if I mean it literally and I'm not sure that I would want to make any literal claims about things like that. Um, maybe it, you know, it's a kind of way of talking. It might be a useful kind of way of talking. Um, I, I would resist any kinds of claims that I am dot, 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 where the dot, dot, dot was either this or this plus my computer, or you know, I, I don't really um, think any of those kinds of metaphysical claims are particularly helpful, to be honest, if you, if you really think that, the, that what you're doing is talking metaphysics as opposed to just talking figuratively or in a way that's useful, uh, you know, and cer certainly, you know, if somebody crashes into my car, I, you know, I, I, might, I might say, you know, it really felt like they, that they were assaulting me, you know, it wasn't just my car, I felt personally affronted because they were so angry, you know, or something. And, but that's just a way of talking, I don't think that you're doing metaphysics, I don't think you're saying something about, I mean, philosophers are always saying, you know, is the person the animal, or is the person the extended mind? And I don't like any of those ises. Um, I resist them. Next question is Barry Smith. Thank you. I find myself strangely wanting to make common cause with Andrew about uh, uh, appealing to metaphysics. And I, I think there was a huge sleight of hand, Murray, I'm afraid, in your response to Ray. So look, um, in the two scenarios you describe and, uh, and where you say, well, from the predicament we're in, um, epistemologically it's the same thing, we, we you know, it won't make a difference, we can't tell. That's not actually true. Um, in one case, I know about what happened in my previous life and I'm thinking back to an episode in my previous life and I know what I was then doing and thinking. In the other case, it's not knowledge. Now, from the inside, those may be indistinguishable, but it would be a very silly thing to say that because they were indistinguishable, they were the same thing, and even to say they were the same thing epistemologically. I mean, look, metaphysically, if your wife were to be replaced every day by an identical copy, you might say, what does it matter? You know, it's all the same to me. You might not be able to tell, but whether you could tell or not wouldn't mean it was always your wife you were seeing. And you would indeed, I think, care about that difference. You'd say, I don't want that. I actually want the same person to confront me, to, to, to meet with every day. Similarly, you can't tell the difference between these two twins, Judy and Trudy, indistinguishable to you. That doesn't mean it's all the same. In one case, you're looking at Judy. In the other case, you're looking at Trudy. So the fact that it doesn't seem to make a difference from the inside, so to speak, doesn't mean there's no difference. There is a difference and it matters. Okay, so, uh, so in, the, in the case of, uh, um, I, mean, I think the, the most, uh, to my mind, the, the most interesting example in this little set that you said there is, is that of my wife who uh, we imagine is replaced at every instant by an identical copy. Well, I, I, I think that you might say that, in a sense, that is exactly what happens, and um, uh, and certainly, certainly, if you take a, a Buddhist perspective, um, uh, then it, you know it is certainly as if that is precisely what happens, and it's only if you have a, as I see it, an overly metaphysical conception of uh, of the person and of and of consciousness that you find that disturbing. Well, but this is exactly what all of these. Uh, would I? Would I? Uh, what is? Would you care? The question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would care because you fr you framed the, uh, the you framed the question in, in in a way in which it is you've made it distinguishable, right? Well, 
Well, they're not epistemologically on a, on a par because you, 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 you say that in the one case you know that these memories are, are real. So, wait, so when you say you know, you're, as, you're assuming something like knowledge is justified, true belief. But the truth is only from a kind of external no, it only, God it, side. It only works when you have an externalist conception of knowledge, what you're saying. Um, but maybe not all of us accept that. Um, anyway, um, shall we go to the next question? Um, you offered uh, the possibility of a therapeutic um, revisiting of one's philosophical assumptions, and and <coughs> the one in yours that I'd like to to identify is um, the closure of the physical, and so that was right up the front end of your of your uh, talk, um, and it, it wasn't withdrawn when we moved from mice to men, um, and I wonder, can you? I I don't think you can get the closure of the physical without um, some metaphysical work. And so I've had a continuing conversation with David Papineau about this, and um, um, the closure of the physical uh, is part and parcel of uh, full-on physicalism, which declares that, uh, apart from the epistemic and methodological naturalism, it has its ontological component, which declares that all there is is what physics says there is, or um, complex configurations of the same. Now, that's a metaphysical as, that's a metaphysical assertion. Certainly not something that physics gives us. The natural sciences don't give us this. Yeah. It can be followed by an open ontological question: Is that all there is? Right? Yeah. And then all my physicalist friends offer me the riposte, saying, "Well, Stephen, show us something that um, doesn't actually." that the physics can't handle, that uh, fix the physical and you fix all the supervenience that's on it. Um, and so I do offer them an example or two. Um, but I just want to, I would like to say that your whole argument has at the front end a philosophical metaphysical position. So, um, so. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so, so, so uh, when you say the whole argument, you, I think, you know, you really mean the argument that's embedded within the wider therapeutic framework that I alluded to at the, at the very end. And, and uh, so, f so for, for sure, that, that argument uh, does, does depend upon certain kinds of assumptions which you, which you might challenge. Now, for me, um, I, I do tend to, to uh, be, uh, you know, I, I, I do at that level have a kind of scientific outlook and I, I tend to think that the, the, the uh, that there is going to be that kind of causal causal closure. So so uh, so so for me, having accepted that, these this this kind of argument and the kinds of garden paths that it leads you down are good for nudging me into a wider perspective where I can challenge the, what I see as the metaphysics, uh, meta, the habit of metaphysical thinking. So if that doesn't uh, if that doesn't uh, work for you, um, that's fine, and I will grant that that uh, that, that the arguments. Uh, in 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 the, the presentation, you know, can be challenged along those lines, and that's fine. As I said at the beginning, I'm I'm interested in really mapping out the conceptual territory, and of course, there are many places where you may challenge bits of the uh, of the argument, and and that's fine. Thank you. Next question. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I was um, very thought provoked by your by your talk, but. I mean, I have a main concern of your main claim, which I really easily buy. There's no excess of physical causation between sensation and perception. But from that, to skip directly to... Just, just as, so it wasn't a claim, that was an assumption. Sorry, sorry, uh, and, right. And, you know, and I'm willing, you know, but yeah. Right, now, but the main point is that to buy this, it doesn't follow to buy the fact that you pass from action to consciousness. And you haven't really made that step. I mean, unless I miss something. But because all, all the thought experiments, um, uh, all, sorry, the, the mental th um, experiment scenario was really fascinating. But from, you know, from assessing or, or at least pointing out the say that no, exce no accession of from the physical. I mean, from action to consciousness, there's something in between that should be worked out before. Um, okay, so I, I, there is absolutely no attempt in in the talk I've presented here to explain consciousness in terms of the physical or, or, or anything of the sort. Rather, it's, it's, it's simply, it's a, 
a theory is an argument, right? And there are certain assumptions to the argument. And, and as, I, as I see it, if you accept these assumptions, then, uh, then there are these three scenarios. You, I think you, you have to be persuaded by one of the three scenarios. If the scenario you're persuaded by is the consciousness is, is preserved scenario, then that leads to, to, to certain consequences. So that's the, in a nutshell, is the structure of the, of the kind of what I went through. And, uh, and I, I have any kind of questions about how consciousness arises from matter or anything no, that are no. orthogonal to that series of, st of steps. No, I just, I just really think that with this kind of thought experiments, you first have to at least give you what, what you think. I mean, it's just a sentence. I mean, it's just I can't make sense of the old pictures you gave unless you tell me what's in between action and, and, and consciousness, what triggers consciousness from action. It's well, not straightforward to me, at I, least. I, I'm going to remain silent But I mean, on I know it's, an, it's another topic. I just think yeah. it's important to make sense of your argument. Okay, sure. Anyway, thank you. Are many more questions? So, first is Roger. There you are. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think this, is, this connects with, um, with Barry's uh, worry. Uh, I've never <coughs> really felt, unless it's maybe a deficiency in me, that that the arguments of people like Parfit and so on uh, really hinge on anything to do with consciousness or personality. They are really arguments about identity through time. And you can replicate them for, for physical objects too. Sure. I mean, there, there is uh, no epistemological distinction between the continuity, continuity of that desk and its constant replacement every instant mm -hmm. by a, a indistinguishable simulacrum. Uh, uh, and so the question is, why do we make this distinction and why do we hang on to the idea of, uh, of uh, identity across time, to which the answer seems to be uh, um, that it is actually, that idea is Im embedded in our way of thinking uh, in just the way that even Zen Buddhists have to accept if they're to think at all. Uh, and uh, maybe therefore we would want to say that th that idea of continuity through time uh, as a, a distinct condition from the constant replacement by the uh, in the four-dimensional ho holograph of ourselves that, that that idea is embedded equally in our conception of uh, of ourselves there are problems i totally agree about um, uh, uh, you know the question of what would you enter that machine that is going to produce two two versions of you at the end, but they are problems for us precisely because we do have a sense of ourselves as being something more than these uh, continuous time slices joined together in a, uh, in, in a sequence. Yeah, um, okay, so, 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 you know, of course, everyone starts talking about the ship of Theseus at this, at this point and, the, and, and uh, you know, uh, and identity through time despite the fact that all the planks are replaced and, uh, and so on. And I think that when it comes to something like the, the ship of Theseus or the objects uh, here, then, then uh, you know, it's not too difficult to persuade people that it's really a matter of convention. You know, it's, it's really, there's really nothing you know, in, in, in the metaphysical fabric that, that, that underpins any kinds of claim of identity of the ship of Theseus over time. It's just a matter of what we, of, of, of convention. Now, and, and of course you might indeed want to say exactly the same thing about personal identity over, over time, but it's just a matter of, of, of convention and so on. But it's much, and, 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 and perhaps that's where we want to, where I might want to end up, but it's a great deal harder, I think, to to be convinced of that, it's a, and I certainly struggle myself philosophically with that, with, with, with it in that case, because there's this in, incredibly strong feeling that you know either I survive or I don't. I mean, it, this is not this is not a matter of convention. This is me. You know, uh, it's it's we're talking about my death here or not, and um, uh, and, and my survival. So, th and 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 the fact that that you might actually have a choice of whether or not to walk into this machine makes it especially. Um, uh, pertinent because because then it means it's not just a, a discussion of or uh, so I mean Parfit for example says there is no fact of the matter and so he so he is uh, in these fission cases so so there that, that means he you know he's he, it's okay for him to say that up on the the lecture uh, podium like this but uh, now I suppose I say to him okay you've got to walk into that machine or not um, then it becomes no longer a philosophical. Uh, discussion where you can 
take a step back and say, well, I'll declare that I, my position is, is that there's no fact of the matter. There it really becomes a, a poignant matter. You've got to think, what, what are you going to do? And it's, I think it's much more difficult to adopt this kind of convention. It's a, just a matter of convention perspective, even if that is where you might want to end up when you've jettisoned a lot of your metaphysical habits. Okay, I, I, I think it makes it, it means that it's very hard to jettison them. Yes, I agree, and uh, very hard, but maybe uh, not, in, not impossible. I wonder what Peter Hacker has to say on that one. <laughs> I, I want to hammer on the, the same nail that a lot of people have been, um, been hitting. I'm, I wonder if why the where's Murray question isn't a lot, isn't actually rather simple, and he's dead. Um, and we've just created two you know, very similar guys in virtual space. I think of the following thought experiment. I'm, if um, if Murray dies and then there's a random quantum event, you know, not that much later, that you know creates whole, you know, whole Murray out of nothing. Whole Murray yeah. um, emulations, however many you want. I'm, we wouldn't even be tempted in that case to say, you know, it's this. I don't think I'm, that it's just the same guy. It's just. I uh, someone very similar to the Murray we know and love, although the Murray we think is wrong. And, um, Mur but the real Murray, uh, the real Murray's dead. So why think that the causal relation in not the quantum case, but the case you describe, is uh, between Murray at, he, and when he dies and when we get these emulations is interesting in this metaphysical way. Why not just think, yeah, the metaphysics doesn't have to go out. We just know that Murray's dead. Yeah, okay, well, um, so I just want to go back to an earlier slide here. Um, so, yeah, let's, where's it gone? Sorry. The, uh, the vanilla resurrection slide. Okay, so, so, I, I, so I think I can, we can abandon all of these questions about, um, about, uh, you know, where's Murray? I, the reason I put where's Murray in quotes is because I'm not sure that it's a very good question in the light of these, uh, these provocative thought experiments. And um, uh, so, so let's replace all of those kinds of questions with simply, would you walk into that machine or not? Would you, given that choice, would you, would you go for this? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, this is uh, on, uh, upon your natural death, right? So, and you don't even have to pay for it, right? With some, the, 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 t the Templeton Foundation will pay, okay? Maybe, maybe we could do a little poll on this. So we could do a test. So if you, if you explain very briefly the two alternatives again, um, we can't um, not vote on it, so then we do a poll. Okay. okay. So, so, so it's the, the vanilla resurrection scenario. You have to, you have to assume that, that, the, uh, technologic, that it's technologically feasible, which it may never be you know, in a thousand years, right? But let's assume that it is. Uh, so you don't have to pay anything, uh, but you simply have to sign on a form to say that when the technology becomes available, you will, uh, uh, a whole brain emulate, you'll be scanned and a whole brain emulation of you will be uh, reconstructed in some uh, world that's not dissimilar to our own. So that's, that's, that's one choice. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're, uh, uh, you're completely, your body and brain are completely destroyed in this uh, and this doesn't happen. So, so who would go for a resurrection? Ah, it has well, to be clarified. I mean, I, Sorry, I, it, it's it's a little. It's one of those. It's one of those questions where you know it's impossible to really frame it in a way which isn't going to beg a lot of other questions. But uh, okay, so <laughs> so we don't we don't clarify the two options. Uh, who goes for uh, for the uh, vanilla resurrection? Puts up his finger or her finger. Not that many. Who doesn't? That's very interesting. Very interesting. Oh, you don't. No. Why do you? Do, why don't you do it? Uh, Why don't I do it? Because, um, well, you know, this is a very, you know, this is a very deep and personal issue. Because I, I, I don't, uh, um, I, I, th I would like to think I fundamentally don't mind the idea that I'm going to die one day. I see. I see. Okay. So you had the next question. Yes. 
Uh, uh, this is not central to the argument, but I wonder uh, what do you think? Is it possible that if you build a, a whole brain emulation of yourself and you're, you are still there, uh, is it possible that this, this two will be co conscious or you exclude this possibility for, for some no, reason? So this will be what, what the, I mean, I have to say, by the way, there's a whole community of of transhumanists who discuss all these scenarios at enormous length, and there's a whole vocabulary and, and, and so on. So that's what they would call a non-destructive scan, right? So where, where we imagine that, that some kind of uh, technology is available uh, to, to non-destructively scan me, like in the teleportation example, and then you create, well, I mean, it's the same scenario as the teleportation uh, scenario where there's the, the the original is still around and then there's this this copy still around. But but do you exclude that they are co-conscious? That it's like you yourself looking at the world from two different bodies and being conscious of the two perspectives. I you know I don't know what to say about those uh, those those kinds of situations. I, I think I would be resistant to say that kind of thing. That it's the, the, there are two me's looking at it from different perspectives. I you know who knows how we would. I suppose, this, suppose these kinds of, you know, I know that this is letting our imaginations run wild in science fiction and so on, but suppose this became a technological reality in a thousand years, right? In the context of philosophy, we need to be able to think in terms of m millennia, right? We really should. In a thousand years' time, the t technology becomes available, then, uh, then no doubt we develop all kinds of, you know, completely different ways of talking about ourselves, I would guess. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid time is up, um, but I want to end by a last poll because I'm interested what you think about these things. So let's go back to the gradual replacements of neurons of mice by the silicon stuff. And there were three scenarios. So one scenario is that there is a threshold. At a certain point, consciousness of the mouse disappears suddenly. That's one. And the second scenario was that consciousness disappears gradually and the last scenario was that there is no difference to the consciousness of the mice. Now, who, who is voting for number one? So there is a threshold and consciousness of the mouse will suddenly disappear. Who is voting for that one? Nobody. Who is voting for gradual disappearance of consciousness? Quite some people. And who, is, who agrees with the speaker that it doesn't make any difference for consciousness? Of the mouse. Of the mouse. Of the mouse. All right, so... The, we are divided on this. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for this very stimulating lecture. Uh, we don't agree, but that's normal in philosophy, I guess. Thank, thank you very much. Just a reminder, we're meeting